Mark, getting us in the spirit of Halloween. All right. <laughs> well, God is with us, and the people say, here we find new life. Yes. I'm Reverend Kevin Weichel. I'm uh, just deeply honored to welcome you here this morning to First Church in Simsbury. Um, this is where we like to say no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. So um, you're going to notice, and I'm just going to mention this, in the bulletin, next to Prelude, we have this phrase. We invite you to use the Prelude as a time for quiet reflection. So I want to tell you when your cue is. Um, so Mark, each week, is going to be, play some gathering music. And that's a time where you can kind of just you know, check in with your neighbors, say hello and all. And then when you see us come down, Mark switches his music over to the prelude. And there are two reasons we're going to, we're, we're going to kind of use this time as, as a time of reflection. One is um, Mark and whoever's doing the prelude, they put a lot of time and thought in, in, into that. Um, and we want to we want to listen and and make sure that we're uh, just being respectful that way. But also, um, a prelude traditionally is a time for for reflection. And so, um, if we could prepare our hearts and minds for worship um, as that prelude is being played, I think it will help all of us get more um, out of the service. So, um, so some gathering music, some checking in time, and then we transition over to uh, some some uh, reflection time. How does that sound? Does that work for everybody? Okay. All right. So. <clears throat> this morning, um, it is my pleasure to welcome a guest preacher. Uh, we have the Reverend Gay Godfrey. Uh, Gay and her husband Colin moved to Simsbury in 2017. She's right here, right? <clears throat> um, some of you, some of you uh, might know Gay well. Uh, others of you might have seen her around, and some of you are saying, I've never seen Gay before, right? So, um, so they, they moved here, Colin and Gay, to be closer to uh, their, their eldest daughter, Miriam, and her husband, Adam, and their two grandkids. That's what brought them to Simsbury. Um, Gay was ordained in the United Church of Canada in 1976. Uh, she was a chaplain at Massachusetts General Hospital before being called as the associate minister to Hancock United Church of Christ in Lexington, Massachusetts, where she served for 28 years. So Gay and Colin became members here in 2017. They sing in the chancel choir and Gay is also, she's currently serving uh, on the Farmington Valley Association Committee on Ministry and with the United Church of Christ Pension Board. So um, welcome Gay. Her message this morning is going to be on this Reformation Sunday talking about how we are called to be a church that is always reforming. Also this morning, uh, Jim Trimble will serve as our lay reader, so we're pleased about that. So welcome Jim in that role. And just a, a couple of notes, um, and you're all doing this, but we're just a, a reminder, when we're indoors here at the church, unless we're, we're up here speaking, uh, we're going to be wearing masks just to respect one another and, and to make sure that we're being careful with, with children and all ages and all kinds of health conditions, and just, uh, it's just a way for us to, to care for one another. Um, and then also, children um, are welcome uh, in, to, to either go straight to the church school wing and spend uh, church school there, and then uh, kind of be picked up and depart from the church school wing, or children are welcome here um, in worship for, for the service. So whichever um, works for you. So now um, I invite us all together to take a deep and spirit-filled breath and to collect um, all of our thoughts, our worries, our joys, um, to think together about um, if our heart is full or empty, if our faith is hanging on by a thread, or if it's strong, whatever it is, um, whether um, you come here um, alone, whether you're watching online, whether you come here with, with a family, no matter how you come, know that you are welcome. And it is our hope that you might experience God's presence here, that we might all leave this place uh, filled with love so that we can spread God's compassion, care, and justice to the rest of the world. Please join me in the quiet of prayer. Spirit of God, come. Be with us during this hour of worship. We ask you to open our hearts and to fill them, to fill our minds, to ignite our spirits and ambitions. Make us mindful of your presence in this place and in our lives. And through our time together, we ask that we hear your voice clearly, that we recognize your call, so that we can leave here ready and willing to follow where you lead. 
Amen. God calls us to worship. God's decrees are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. We celebrate the faith that was. Happy are those who seek God. With my whole heart, I seek you. We celebrate the faith that is. I shall walk at liberty, for I have sought your precepts. We celebrate the faith that will be. Together, Together we, we worship, worship God. God. God teaches us how to love, completely, uniquely, unconditionally. Let us confess our difficulty to be as loving as God teaches us, as we pray, saying, Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide. 
and too deep to undo. Forgive what neglect our lips tremble to name, what callousness our hearts can no longer bear, what mischief our hands cannot deny. Save us, set us free from a past that we cannot change. Walk along the paths we tread today and open to us your grace-filled future. Through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. Please join me in a moment of silent prayer. In God's kingdom, all are loved for who they are, not what they do. In God's kingdom, all are forgiven for what they do and don't. In God's kingdom, all are welcomed and fed by God's grace and hope. Forgiven, loved, sent forth. We are not far from God's kingdom. Thanks be to God. Amen.
The Old Testament reading is from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children, and talk about them when you are at home, and when you are away, when you lie down, and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead. And write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The New Testament reading is from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 12, verses 28 through 31. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, Which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, The first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. These are holy words. Thanks be to God. Good morning, church. I am really privileged to be a part of worship today. Kevin asked me to preach on Halloween, but only church nerds, or perhaps former Lutherans, know that it is also Reformation Day. And I took a guess, and if you want a Halloween sermon, it will have to wait. Will you join me in prayer? Spirit of God, the psalmist says your word is more precious than fine gold, sweeter than purest honey, and a lamp unto our feet. Let your word grace us, so that the good news of your love will shine before our eyes and delight our senses, so that we cannot help but respond with wonder, faith, and trust. Amen. Down through the corridors of religious history, today we hear this sound. Thanks, Kevin. (laughs) Martin Luther, an energetic 33-year-old Augustinian friar, hammering his 95 thesis to the door of the castle church of Wittenberg, Saxony. These were not, as you might think, revolutionary grievances, but rather a tweet inviting debate and it went viral. 
Alec Ryrie, in his book Protestantism, writes that the Protestant Reformation made and remade what we consider to be modern Western civilization. Regardless of what your faith is, Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, or atheist, Protestantism has affected it for good and for ill. Everyone on the globe lives in a world where Protestant Christianity has shaped and even governed the way entire nations thought and acted. Today, though this may surprise you, one-eighth of the world's people are Protestant. Protestants, as you know, divorced the Roman Catholic Church, and we know too well how that first split has become a fractal. There are somewhere north of 9,000 Protestant denominations, not including some who would definitely call themselves Protestants, like the 122 denominations of Mormons and the 29 denominations of Unitarians, among a couple hundred others. You may remember that the Reformation was not the first of the church's great diver divergences. We have learned from historians that about every 500 years, when the world is forced to change its mind, to jettison old ways of thinking and doing because they conflict with a new reality, the church too finds itself in the job of cleaning house. And this opens up a whole new set of challenges to face and a vibrant faith in which to rejoice. Dr. Fick Phyllis Tickles calls this a garage sale. Some previous held ideas are set aside to make room for the new vision and prepare the church to address these new challenges. Now, just a quick reminder. 500 BC-ish was the Great Transformation. It occurred independently in four different regions, producing Taoism and Confucianism in China, Buddhism and Hinduism in India, Judaism in the Middle East, and philosophic rationalism in Greece. Zero-ish. The Great Commission. Christianity was born in an upheaval within Judaism about who Jesus was. Emmanuel, God with us in the flesh. 500 AD-ish, the great consolidation. Rome fell and Pope Gregory I enclosed the church behind clo cloister walls. 1000 AD-ish, the great schism. It describes the split between the Eastern Orthodox and the Western church. Then comes the Great Reformation, about 1500. Our Congregational Church was founded when the sainted Robert Brown wrote that the Church of England was too connected to the Crown and the Puritans were too slow with their reforms, tarrying was his word. He felt compelled to separate from them. This separatist church would disagree with and act without approval from the local magistrate. And that landed him in jail, of course, about 23 times. Brownists, as his followers were known, fled persecution to Holland. And later, they made up the majority of the passengers on the Mayflower in 1620. Today, the changes brought by the great emergence of the second millennium are coming at us fast. Advances and conundrums in physics, biology, and technology are leading the way. So I'm someone who really likes novelty. But the changes that we are experiencing are beyond current human ability to absorb. And COVID has unintentionally accelerated these changes. You and I may wish to go back to the way things were, 
to worship in a more familiar church culture, more like the one we grew up in. To know that we are in tune with others sharing the values, which today we sometimes find marking us as a little fuddy-duddy. Or to live in a more leisurely world, not, constantly, not a constantly quaking quasar quantum universe. But I'm afraid you will have to take that up with your maker because you chose to be born at the wrong time. <laughs> like it or not, we can't put on the brakes. Just try to manage daily life without an email account. We can't escape the raging torrent of mind-bending challenges facing us. Faith faithful Christians will search to discern, along with those first-century scribes who were also in a liminal time, what is most important. In such times, just as before, there will be false starts and great leaps. There will be among us recalcitrants and firebrands. And we will surely experience profound grief and deep joy as we become accustomed to whatever this new thing is. And it was never easy to live in such a time. Remember Anne Boleyn? She found it a real pain in the neck. <laughs> what will Christianity look like 100, 200, 500 years from now? Will it be any less confounding than today when Trump and Lady Gaga, Putin and MC Hammer all claim Christianity as their spiritual home. Alec Reary writes, Protestants are fighters and lovers. They will argue with anyone about almost anything. Some of these arguments are abstruse, others brutally practical. If we look at the great theological battles of the past 500 years, for and against religious toleration, for and against slavery, for and against imperialism, fascism, or communism, we will find Protestants on both sides. But Protestants are also lovers. From the beginning, a love affair with God has been at the heart of our faith. Mark tells us this morning that the scribes were arguing yet again, this time, what's the most important? And Jesus answers with, as would any faithful Jew, the Shema, hear, O Israel. And he adds to it the law from Leviticus 19. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. These are the essentials, says Jesus. Uh, you say, there's got to be more to it than that. Otherwise, there never would have been the 95 Thesis. What more is there for you? What are some theses that you could put up on the wall or have Kevin pound to that door that would invite discussion today? Let's start with easy stuff. These three theses I know my parents could have posted. And today, we have already discussed and decided them. Theses. A church needs stained glass and a pipe organ to be a proper church. <laughs> Theses. Deacons should wear morning coats to serve communion. Now, don't laugh at that one. In one Massachusetts parish, that dress code was only relaxed in 1970. Theses. Children may take communion. 
Now, how about some that our generation would still need to debate? Thesis. Video technology is a necessary aid for modern worship. Now, I know that COVID helped us decide this one, but perhaps in some quarters it's maybe still being debated? Thesis. Missionaries no longer have an essential role in the modern church. Considering colonial oppression and all of its evils, that's something to decide. Thesis. Church leaders should not take a side in the political acrimony of the day. Hmm. Is that a little too soon? <laughs> While the church is cleaning out its attic, is there something in there, something so important to your personal faith with which you would not want to part? Small things, say a hymn from the old hymnal, or a particular style for the Christmas Eve service, a family Bible, or the Book of Common Prayer, a Huguenot cross necklace, or maybe your grandmother's rosary. Is there a tenant of the faith that makes it or breaks it for you? something in one of the historic creeds. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. Oh yeah, that one still brings the Pope and the Patriarch to blows. Something you learned from a wise teacher. Think globally, act lo locally, and religion is mm, a little irrelevant or a private strain of piety or ritual that you cling to fiercely because you can still recall your encounter with the divine there. So what thesis would I put on my door? I'll speak for today because I like it new every day and tomorrow it might be different. I propose thesis that simplicity of faith is not a virtue because following Jesus means understanding and grappling with our faith in all its complexity in order to share a nuanced gospel with the people of our day. Thesis. Dualistic thinking should be reimagined as dialectical thinking because following Jesus means setting to one side those metaphors which divide the world, either or, flesh, spirit, church, world, us, them. And we should move toward those expressions of faith which tell of the unscheduled and surprising encounters with the transcendent God. Thesis. Cynicism, which is fear, often born of personal suffering, cynicism, which is a fear of radical commitment, erodes our capacity for love and hope. And following Jesus demands a vivid imagination to see and embrace what does not yet exist, and the commitment to bring that vision into the present reality. So where would you draw the line and over what things? It's not an idle question. The Anglican Church of North America was cashiered from the Lambeth Conference because of its refusal to marry LBGTQ people. Now we confess that every theological doctrine and every biblical expression of faith is at one level or another a compromise of the purest, ultimate expression of the gospel that God originally expressed to us. And we Protestants have always challenged these compromises, visiting and revisiting them in an attempt to make deliberate, contemporary choices to follow Jesus more faithfully. Reinhold Niebuhr, he of the Serenity Prayer, wrote, Protestantism is a movement, not an institution, a spirituality, 
not a confession, and it is shown by its fruits, not its doctrine. What are the things that really matter? Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. The true and enduring radicalism of Protestantism is its readiness to question every human authority and tradition for the sake of loving God and neighbor with all our soul. So today, on Reformation Sunday, let, remi let me remind you of John Robinson, another of our great congregational saints, who on the eve of the pilgrim's departure from Leiden preached what we often sing. For I am very confident the Lord hath more truth and light yet to break forth from his holy word. Amen. Please be seated. I just want to take a moment to thank Gay, getting us uh, thinking about what would be on our thesis, a thesis of our lives. Just really thank you for helping us to wonder and then bringing it back to loving God and, and uh, with all our heart, strength, and mind. Um, I also want to say that, um, to be clear, uh, I did not ask her to preach on Halloween, just that this is on Halloween. You know, there's a, there's a difference. There's a difference. Um, speaking, speaking of Halloween, you know, I want to say that, um, you know, the church has, the church, right, has really struggled with its relationship with, with Halloween. And I want to say, um, today, let's, let's celebrate this because there are a couple aspects of Halloween that, that are really pretty cool. So first of all, kids get to dress up and be whatever they want to be, right? using their creativity, their imagination, and God wants us to have fun. So that's a great thing. And then we also uh, get to welcome children 
and neighbors and people we don't know, strangers, to our homes uh, and to, to, to see them, to see their faces, to give them candy and to watch them smile. So it's a wonderful thing. So today, as Christians, let's not be afraid to uh, celebrate Halloween. I have um, another celebration, and that is um, actually Jessica. Could you come on up here? So today um, is Jessica's last day in the AV booth, okay? Yeah, yeah. So um, we, we have some plans, which, which we can talk about later, but today I want to I wanna celebrate Jessica. So how this worked was way back when, and boy, we've all lost track, lost track of time, so I'm not quite sure exactly when, but at some point she identified that um, we needed some help, right? We had, we had uh, Annie Petiti coming, who is just not here today. She's still back there uh, most Sundays, but, but we needed more than one person doing the AV stuff, and she said, hey, I'll do it. And so we were inside here at first, and Jessica was doing that. We moved outside, and Jessica was doing that. We moved back inside, and Jessica was doing that. And she learned all of uh, the things along the way, including like reading through the manuals and all that stuff for all, that, uh, all, all the, the, the technology back there. So we're really grateful for you, for your willingness to do that. But she needs to go back to church school, right? Because she is our church school director. And so next week she'll be back there with, with the students and the teachers where she belongs. But we just wanted to say thank you for your, you know, just rock solid commitment to being here all the time, to doing this and your flexibility and willingness to jump in wherever you're needed. So thank you very much. Yeah. So uh, we, we gather together for our celebrations and concerns, knowing that God is present with us and hears our joys and sorrows, and knowing that as a community, a, a Christian faithful community, it is important to, to share with one another on life's journey um, how the ways in which our hearts are full and the ways that we need encouragement. So I, I start with um, a prayer for Brad Spear, who's the oldest brother of Roger. Um, Brad is in the hospital after suffering uh, many uh, many uh, massive strokes, and um, so thankfully Roger was able to, to be up there, Roger and Barbara, and spend 20 minutes with his brother, but um, it's a really tough time uh, for them, and so prayers for Brad. We pray for uh, Lois and Herb Salch. Um, you've heard me say over the weeks that Herb has been in hospice care, and he still is, and um, you know, he's, he's doing okay uh, as, as far as, you know, he's, he's very much aware as to what's going on. He's, he's very much uh, tuned into what's going on here at the church. Um, but this past week, Lois, uh, his wife, had a stroke. And so, um, so now Lois is in the hospital, is, and they're not able to be together. So it's, it's just a really uh, hard time. She's still in the hospital. Um, hopefully will be uh, being released from there. Uh, this this week, but it might be a while until they're able to be back together. I know so many of you love and care for the Salches, so keep them in your prayers. Um, I'd like to pray for uh, my mother-in-law, Carol, um, Carol Herstein, who is in the hospital with heart arrhythmia. Uh, we pray good health for Michelle Crump, friend of Luann McDonough. We pray for Bill, friend of Megan Shuck. And Patty Gilbert, Cynthia told me this morning that she's doing uh, pretty well. So uh, continues pr uh, prayers for Patty, um, but we're really glad to hear that news. We pray for Hubie, great uncle of Jen, uh, for Bill Stanley, and strength and courage for Patty Scanlon. Of course, we pray for, uh, in our prayers, a solace and peace for our facilities manager, Ardell McGee, for his wife, Anna, and their family um, upon the passing of their oldest daughter, Christy. Um, a service for Christie was held yesterday in the Dominican Republic. Um, as an expression of um, our care um, and support, um, we uh, have opened a fund where folks can contribute, and many have done so. We're grateful for that um, to help them with flight and funeral expenses. So if you're interested in, in contributing to that fund, you can go to our, our webpage, to the homepage. There's a giving tab. Uh, you can scroll down there, and you can find a way to support Ardell and Anna. We pray for the Tyler and Hume families on the passing of Sally's mother, Joan. For Elizabeth McCloy, dear friends of the Caponetti family uh, who is nearing the end of life. And we pray for Ted and Sandy Christensen. When considering our wider world, we pray for the people of Sudan where the military has seized power and dissolved civilian-led transitional government. 
We pray for our elected officials that they may lead with wisdom and integrity. We pray for economic, environmental, and racial justice in our country. And we pray for peace on earth. So for those gathered here, what additional prayers might you have this day? Yes. Yeah, for the Moore family, their son battling brain cancer. Thank you, Cheryl. Karen. For the health of our planet. For the health of our planet. Mm -hmm. Amen. Prayers for Katie. Thank you. Jim. For one of Jim's students whose mother passed away, for all those grieving. Thank you. I'd also like to mention um, we had a service in the memorial garden for uh, Hap Pool yesterday. His family came down. You know, so many of you remember Hap, and it was wonderful to celebrate his life. Will the Lord be with you? <clears throat> Holy One, we lift these prayers, those prayers spoken aloud and those prayers that remain silent on our hearts, we lift them to you, knowing that you receive them as you receive us with wide open arms. Loving and gracious God, we look to you as not only our great example, but also our constant companion. And so when we cannot see beyond the mundane, when our future looks bleak, and in those moments when we find ourselves paralyzed by situations that are life depleting, you remind us of your preferred future for our lives, a future with hope, a future of abundant life. When we feel lonely, when our human interactions produce pain, and when we find ourselves at our most unlovable, you remind us that we are your children and recipients of your unconditional love and presence. As your beloved, we yearn to be a loving people, a people who are known by our love of God and of love of neighbor. As such, we come alongside those we know to be in need, emotionally, physically, spiritually. Lord, we seek healing and wholeness in our relationships and in our world. We pray for those who live in the midst of conflict, violence, or war, and for those working for justice and peace. We pray for those who have had their lives interrupted by severe weather and those striving to ensure our planet has a healthy future. We pray for those who are unemployed and those who are underemployed, for those who worship their work and for those who labor tirelessly for more just economic structures. We seek to be a church that is listening to your Holy Spirit in our midst, always reforming to the ministries most needed by our membership, community, and world. We pray the spirit of collaboration, that it might triumph over the lore of competition wherever and whenever people of faith interact with one another. We pray all of this in the name of the one who taught his disciples to pray these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
So thankfully the weather is nice today and so we'll gather for fellowship outside with apple cider and some games. There's a new game this week. It's a giant Connect Four. So I want to see some people playing this. It looks like a lot of fun. Um, so uh, some fellowship outside. Please join us out there. It's just good to be together again and to uh, just catch up with one another. Um, also, this week there will be uh, paving in the lot. I know some of you understand <laughs> how to navigate uh, trucks and steamrollers and bulldozers on your way in this morning. I guess they started working already. Um, so uh, my understanding, what we've been told, is that you will be able to come in this part of the lot during the week, but down there not so much. Um, they are supposed to be finished at the end of the day Wednesday uh, with, with the paving. So thank you for your patience. Um, I also want to mention this Wednesday evening, um, there'll be a young adult group gathering. They'll be ga gathering at the Iron Horse Pub for Trivia Night. Uh, so if you're interested in that, um, uh, uh, Abby Ritson and Erica Pandolfi are leading that, that event. Um, you can contact them. If you don't know how to get a hold of them, please contact the church office, or you can talk to me. I can put you in touch. Uh, Wednesday Bible study. It's at 10 a.m. Um, it's been on Zoom. And uh, that's just a nice way to, to meet. People can kind of meet in the comfort of their own homes and, and kind of catch in uh, to, to the scripture and, and read it together and talk about it together and check in with one another. Um, if you haven't joined in on the Wednesday mi uh, morning Bible study, it's, it's really wonderful. Um, and it's really nice because we, we always go over the scripture that's going to be uh, read on Sunday morning and preached about. So it's just a nice way to prepare yourselves for worship as well. Also, the Sunday morning uh, book study. Um, if you're interested in that, you can, you can see Mark. Uh, Mark's email is up there, of course, and I know you're, you're doing a new, a new book, right, Mark? So, um, so it's an exciting time for that group, and you can join in and start with a, new, a fresh new book. Can you, can you say again what the book is? Uh, direct against the end of Jesus and the Virgin Mary. Oh, to the end. Right. The, but you can join any time. Thanks for correcting me. Getting to the end. All right. <laughs> but still join any time. All right. So, a women's walk is on Tuesdays at 10 a.m., and that's behind Fitzgerald's, okay? So, as we gather now for our offering, just to re remind that it is, it is uh, part of the life of the church that we, we give back to uh, these ministries. Uh, we praise God for all the ministries and gifts of this church, and we ask now um, to give with the fullness of your hearts. <clears throat>
Gracious and loving God, we ask now your blessings upon these gifts. We pray that they might go to make a difference in our church and in our world to spread your love, compassion, justice, and joy to all who need it. It's in your holy name that we pray. Amen. Christ within you, the hope of glory to come. Go out into the world in peace. And all that you do, do it for love and in the name of Jesus. And may the blessing of God, creator, Christ, and comforter, be with us all, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>